Welcome, everyone, to the Rotten Horror Picture Show, the podcast where we talk about films off the Rotten Tomatoes 200 Greatest Horror... Is it best? Is greatest? I think it's best. <laughs> 200 Best. There it is. 200 Best Horror Movies of All Time list, uh, which I think will have, be in a little bit of a debate about today. Mm. Uh, my name is Clay. With me, as always, is Amanda. Amanda, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Um, so today we're talking about number 90 on the list, number which is, 90. yeah, number 90. I think the running thing at the end of every episode, you know, we talk about like, oh, does it deserve its place? I think mm-hmm. a running thing is going to be, does this deserve to be higher than The Shining? Because <laughs> <clears throat> The Shining yeah. is number 101. God damn and it. And this is number 90. And I'm, that's not to say this is a bad movie. Okay. But, okay. Um, okay. Number 90, uh, Let Me In from 2010. Uh, it's got an 88% with a 94.856 adjusted score, which puts it at number 90 on this weird, uh, list. Um, have you seen, had you seen this before? I have not. <clears throat> but you're familiar with the book. Yes. Had you seen the Swedish version? No. No, I, I kind of just missed the film versions of this altogether, which is actually really weird when I think about it because mm. I really enjoyed the book. Yeah. Yeah. So... Well, I think uh, we're, we're going to have a, a, a lot to talk about as far as the book and the movie and mm-hmm. the two versions of the movie. Um, I had seen this once before a while ago, but I didn't remember a lot about it. I just remembered it being very similar to the Swedish one. Mm. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, this was I think the biggest thing for me was this was I was surprised, as we'll get into that this was on the list. But Let the Right One In itself, the original, was not. Yeah. So we can talk about that when we get into it a little bit more. We'll play the trailer, and we will be right back. As some of you may have heard, there was an incident last night. One of your recent graduates here was killed. In the meantime, we need you all to be on the lookout for any suspicious activity. You guys just moved in, huh? How do you know? I live next door to you. What happened there? Some kids from school? I'll help you. But you're a girl. I'm a lot stronger than you think I am. Can you hear me through the wall? Only sometimes. I found another body a few days ago. Victim completely drained of blood. Please don't see that boy again. Where's your dad? He pissed on my dad. Hey! What was that? What was going on? Hello? What are you? Really? I need blood to live. Hey there. You okay? There's a whole lot more than just what's been going on around here. This goes way back. Other states, other cities. I have to go away. Maybe you got something you want to tell me? Do you think there's such a thing as evil? So, Let Me In, directed by Matt Reeves, written by Matt Reeves, based on the novel and screenplay Let the Right One In by John, I'm not going to take a shot at that middle name, so I'm just going to say John Lundquist. (laughs) <laughs> starring Cody Smith McPhee, Clay, Chloe Grace Moritz, Richard <laughs> the names Jensen. names are really out to get you in this one. Yeah, it's too many. Two names, people. Come on. <laughs> Chloe Grace Moretz, Richard Jenkins, Cara Buono, and Elias Codius. Coteus. <laughs> it's Casey Jones from the Ninja <laughs> Turtles movie. Uh, what happens in this movie, Amanda? Bullied at school, neglected at home, and incredibly lonely, 12-year-old Owen spends his days plotting revenge on his tormentors and spends his nights spying on other residents of the apartment complex. His sole friend is Abby, a strange girl who comes out only at nighttime. Both outcasts, the two form a strong bond. When Abby's caretaker disappears amid a series of gruesome murders, Owen begins to suspect that she is hiding a terrible secret. 
And uh, you might like this movie if you like prepubescent vampires, extreme two-faced cosplay, Casey Jones from the Ninja Turtles <laughs> movie looking confused, dads who go out to the store to pick up some blood and just never come back, and of course, questionable, questionable parenting. parenting. <clears throat> this is a big one. I feel like American Psycho, we were stretching a <laughs> little bit to keep it up. Yeah, but this yeah, is, you, uh, you, you like... You combed American Psycho to find us our uh, just our one up. thread yeah. to include the questionable parenting bingo spot, and this this one just was all questionable parenting yeah, this, all the time. This should be questionable parenting the movie, the film, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, more like let in a social service worker. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, one of the things that I did like about this movie uh, personally is that it was a, a Hammer production. Yeah, I spotted that, and because we we had chatted a little bit, I think maybe after we recorded the last mm-hmm. one about Hammer Films, like as an entity, and and I hadn't realized that they were still making movies. Well, um, I could save this for the Hammer podcast when we get to the eventual. <laughs> I know there's at least one Hammer movie on this list, um, but Hammer was was making movies up until I want to say the mid 70s mm. and then they shut down they had done a bunch of uh of vampire and um horror movies that kind of filled the gap after the universal stuff stopped making okay. horror movies um but yeah they shut down in the like mid to late 70s and then mm. they didn't really exist until around 2005 ish like mid 2000s where they mm. I don't know if someone bought the name, but all of a sudden Hammer was back and they were going to start making movies again. And I don't know if it ever really (laughs) took because the only movies I ever saw with the Hammer logo on it were this one and a movie called, I would think it's called The Tenant. I'd have to look it up anyway. But Mm -hmm. it was was another movie that no one had seen. Okay. Um, Which I I don't know if they're still doing it. I I was kind of disappointed if th- that they stopped, or at least I was hoping that they would come back a little bit stronger. But yeah, yeah, you know, it is what it is. Sorry. Um, so yeah, this is a uh, an American remake. Yes. <laughs> of a Swedish horror movie that was based on a Swedish book. Yes. And uh, there seems to be a lot. I was looking it up briefly before mm-hmm. we started. And uh, it seems like there's quite a bit of game of telephone going on between the book and this movie. Yeah. Because the book seems to be very, very dark. Yes. Like, (laughs) very dark. Yes. The movie, the Swedish movie, the original, is also very dark, but Mm -hmm. it's not as dark as the book. And then the American movie is, it's still dark, it's not as dark as the movie, the first movie or the book, but it's also, it's got a bit of a different spin on it. That's yeah. a little bit more American, actually. Yes. Yeah. I, I definitely think I, I read somewhere that um, this movie was sort of made to be a more accessible to a wider audience version of sure. the Swedish movie. And having not seen the Swedish version of the movie, but having read the book, I can see where they sort of have tweaked certain things. They definitely, I think, condensed the characters down. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, Americanized the names and everything. Um, and yeah, they, uh, without getting into too many specifics, I think there are some some details and some relationships and some thematic issues that they very much rewrote to be a little less, uh, shall we say, illegal. Icky. Or illegal, <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, you know, is it illegal if the, if it's a two hundred year old vampire? I don't know. But, um, that's not to say I don't want to. I don't want to turn this into comparing this movie to uh, a, a movie you haven't seen and a book I haven't read. Right. Right. So um, <laughs> between the two of us, we've got them all covered. Yeah. But. Yeah. I think I think it's uh, uh, enough to kind of touch on that stuff. But um, yeah. uh, so, what did you think of this? Uh, I enjoyed it. I really liked it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was I was a little bit. Um, skeptical going in uh a remake of a movie that's an an adaptation of a book just seems like maybe a couple degrees too far Mm -hmm. um but you know taking it for what it was i i really enjoyed i enjoyed it visually i thought it was like very beautifully done in its way yeah Yeah. it it really it really has a very a very strong atmosphere a very clear vision of of how you know they wanted it to look Mm -hmm. um and I found myself surprisingly compelled by um, Abby. Yeah. Yeah. Chloe Grace Moretz. Like, yeah. like, I was kind of ready to not buy the, like, little girl thing, kind of knowing going into it, her deal. Mm-hmm. Um, but I thought I thought she was great. Yeah. Yeah. I um, 
I also uh, liked this a lot. I hadn't, I hadn't seen the original. I don't know, in, in at least ten years, probably. I mean, mm. it came out. In, the original came out in two thousand eight. Yeah. Uh, I think I saw it probably shortly after that. I didn't see it in the theater, but I definitely saw it when it came out on video. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought that was great. Uh, and when they, when I saw they were making a remake that looked very very similar, I kind of wrote it yeah. off a little bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, having having the space now to kind of look at it fresh from the other one, mm-hmm. I th- I think it's really good. Yeah. It's. Um, the thing for me that stood out was I um, I think this is I, I did want to talk about this a little bit as far as uh, the setting being the, mm. the the 80s yeah and it's I believe it's the it's the 80s in the book yes but the 80s in America <laughs> is very different than the 80s in Sweden yeah um, obviously me being a Swedish <laughs> history scholar I can tell of you that course. is a fact but um and i was former swedish citizen (laughs) clay mccormick yes um but i was uh uh i was i was trying to think about it and this seems to be one of the first horror movies of the 21st century to start doing that we're going to set it in the 80s for a very specific set of imagery and kind of like uh I think it. I think it yeah. gets. It skews a little too nostalgia now, where it's like this isn't Stranger Things, where it's mm. okay. We're just gonna revel in the '80s stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is set in the '80s. It chooses '80s America. It seems like for a very specific purpose, which is just what it was like growing up. Yeah. As a the child of a divorced family of that time, yes. where you be, you have these latchkey kids who are left on their own for a lot. Mm-hmm. And from what I understand between this, the original and the book, the biggest difference in this seems to be that um, Abby and Owen are a lot more of a mirrored pair that kind of come together. Yeah. Of both coming from, I guess you could call them broken homes to an yeah, extent. Yeah, Sing- single um, parent households. Yeah. Before, you, before we get into how manipulative <laughs> Abby might be being. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I really thought that the character stuff really benefited from the setting. Yeah, I agree. And I and I think um the the setting the setting does a lot of work in a couple ways. And I, I found it interesting because I, I I'm so far removed from my experience of reading the book that mm-hmm. I, I remembered the kind of the basic plot beats and the basic characters. Mm-hmm. Um but I didn't remember this the time period. So I was really thrown when it started because it looked very, I mean, it definitely didn't look modern, but I knew this came out 10 years ago. And so then I I, I had, I had a little trouble placing it until there's like a Reagan is talking on the TV or something like that. And then I was like, oh shit. All right. This is set further back than I thought. And then obviously you start to notice that more and more in terms of, you know, the, the make and the models of the cars, Mm -hmm. the way people are dressed. Um, also, as you were saying, you know, the sort of lack of parental supervision over children. Um, it also benefits the plot benefits from it because there's no cell phones. Right. Sure. You know, nobody can just say, Oh, here, let me take out my cell phone here. Mm -hmm. Call your parents or, or, or whatever. And, um, yeah, it definitely heightens the feeling of isolation and aloneness yeah. at night when yeah. people are just sort of out walking or, you know, walking their dog or taking a jog. Like it, it seems they seem further away from civilization, even when they're not like out in the wilderness, mm-hmm. because knowing it's the 80s, there's no easy and quick way to get in contact with somebody if something goes wrong. Yeah, and and speaking of the, the uh, sort of the production design as far as the cars and everything. Um, it, it, have you, have you watched Sex Education on Netflix? No. You should. It's very, very good. Okay. Um, but they do, it, 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 they do a thing in that show where I don't know if this is 100% intentional or what, but if you didn't know what year it took place in, Mm -hmm. you wouldn't be able to tell other than the fact that they have cell phones. Mm. So the cars feel a lot older, the, uh, just the... Um, environment doesn't feel modern. Yeah. Uh, the clothes feel kind of retro-y. 
uh, but they all have modern phones. So it's mm. it, it it's it's kind of like um, it follows does a similar thing. Okay, yeah, where yeah. you can't really place it in a time period except for the fact that like one person has a digital thing, but even right. that thing's kind of weird. Right. Everybody's got black and white TVs for some reason. Yeah, it's like a slightly alternate universe to the one that we live in. Yeah, <laughs> almost. Yeah, and uh, this does a really great job of using that time period, but not bringing a ton of attention to it. Yeah, because it's not like. Uh, it's not like, you know, Owen is, is wearing a, uh, Michael Jackson t-shirt and right. his, he's got a sister who's, you know, got the shoulder pads, suits, getting ready to go <laughs> Lots out. Lots of scrunchies in her hair. Yeah. And it's not like a soundtrack. <laughs> it's got some 80 songs on it, yeah, but, it's, but even but those are the background. Yeah. And, and they're, and they're the kinds of songs that are still pretty ubiquitous. Yeah. Like a lot of them you could still feasibly hear on the radio or somebody might be listening to like in their car. Um, they're still fairly, fairly popular songs, mm-hmm. so it, it didn't feel jarring to me. Yeah. Um, but one thing that I, I did, not to change the subject too, too much, but the setting sort of threw me. Um, where... So I realized this as as I was watching it. When, you, when this movie starts, where do you think it's taking place? Um... Like before you have any clear idea of where you are geographically, what would you what would your first guess be? Not New Mexico. Right. Which is the only reason I know that is because at the very, very beginning there's a title card that says New Mexico. Yeah. And I would not I didn't know that it snowed in New Mexico. I didn't Apparently either. it does. I mean, I, I I guess if anybody from New Mexico ever listens to this, you guys should let us know if you if it snows there and we're just ignorant. Yeah, I guess there's um, a there is a northern new mexico i suppose yeah so. yeah i mean i i i believe it but it, it just felt like a very it's an odd choice s- yeah exactly yeah. that's that's exactly what i was just gonna say like it's a very strange choice if you want to keep that sort of dark cold snowy short gray days long cold nights vibe that like sweden would have yeah. in the winter time why not set your 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 movie in you know North Dakota. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, like Wyoming or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, like there's, there's lots of options if you want to make it in the United States, but put it somewhere where there's maybe some big open spaces, but cold winters and short days. Yeah. I wonder if, uh, I mean, I'm not going to look this up now, but I wonder if maybe <laughs> Matt Reeves grew up there or something. Maybe, oh. you know, he has some sort of connection to it, but I don't know. That's, a, no that's an interesting proposition, but it, it, yeah, it just, it still <clears throat> struck me as a very odd choice. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the the only other thing I was going to say about the time period is that I think what they do well by not really bringing your attention to to it as intensely is it it uses it the the elements of that time mm-hmm. are used very well as a setting for the story. Yeah, because um, you've got you know you've got Reagan on on the TV talking mm. about uh, he's it's some famous speech that I can't remember, but it's uh, some some something about evil. <laughs> that immediately sets the tone straight away. Um, I could say a lot of political leaning things right now, but yeah. I will not. Um, and then, like I think, in that same, yeah, in the same first scene when uh, Casey Jones goes up to talk to, <laughs> that's just how I'm going to refer to him. I didn't know that was him. Yeah, I didn't it's know the, it. it. He's one of those actors where, like, I saw him in something so at very young, mm. and that's the only thing I know him as from now yeah, on because he he's not he in a forever. ton of stuff. Yeah. So when I do see him and stuff, I'm like, oh, hey, Casey Jones. <laughs> Um, cricket. Yeah. Well, you got to know what a crumpet is if you want to understand cricket. <laughs> oh God. Uh, but uh, when he goes up to talk to the the father, quote unquote, who had mm. you know, who's in the hospital and burned himself yes. and all this kind of stuff. Thomas, I believe, Thomas? is the father's name. He uh, he asks him if he was if he's part of some sort of satanic cult. Yeah. It's doing like a cult murder. So you've got the eighties satanic panic yeah. thing kind of working in there. Yeah, that's a really good point. And uh, um, it's just that whole, and like I said, the thing about the uh, the generation of kids who are kind of left on their own. Yes. It was the heyday of the school bully. Oh, yeah. At least yeah. in popular culture anyway. Yeah. Um, so all that stuff, I think, works really well to its advantage mm-hmm. without it being, here's the soundtrack from Let Me In featuring Kaj- Kajagugu and yeah. the Thompson <laughs> Twins and Duran Duran. Yeah. Yeah. And look at these cool sunglasses everyone's wearing, oh my you know. God. Yeah, it's like everybody's dressed kind of in like browns and tans and and grays and sort of generic clothing that you wouldn't really remark upon. Um 
how do you feel? Do you uh, what do you think about Abby, the character of her? You said you you liked her you, you liked her a bit quite a bit. I did, yeah. yeah. I I I did, and that's not to say that I think she's like a wonderful person or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but I I enjoyed it, it's it's a complex character. I feel like it's it's a difficult character because it would be very very easy to sort of flatten her out mm. into either a complete monster a complete victim mm-hmm. um, or something in between like, like, like not, but still not keep all the layers and the levels of like how old she actually is. Right. Um, the fact that she is constantly being probably underestimated and, and, you know, treated condescendingly by the adults around her when she's older than all of them and has experienced more than all of them mm-hmm. and is more dangerous than all of them. Mm-hmm. And then there is that animalistic, you know the, the the vampires in this movie or the vampire there's really only her um it's very much like a like a a very yeah animalistic sort of barely human persona that she kind of becomes like there's still obviously uh, an in- intent and intellect and a mm-hmm. brain behind it, but it's clear that like there are certain instincts that take over right. when she's in that mode. Yeah, um, and to show you the inner workings of the mind of a desperate teenage boy, yeah. after he watches her viciously <laughs> eat someone and turn to a monster, mm-hmm. the next scene he's got like his nice clothes on and he's like, I think I still got a shot. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I think she'll still be my girlfriend. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I, I don't want to. I don't want to jump the gun too much. Talking about her, um, her personality and and the potential that she is actually kind of masterminding a lot of different things going on mm-hmm. in, in the in this. But I think there is that layer there too, where she is sort of she needs Thomas, mm-hmm. her quote unquote caretaker or, or father or whatever you want to label him as. She needs him in order to operate in the world. So she's dependent on him. But she clearly also controls him. Mm. It's um, kind of it's kind of weird that she needs him to go out and kill for her, isn't it? Because you, you, wouldn't you think it, it would be less conspicuous if she just did it herself? I think there's, there's two things. I think when she is in her full vampire mode, mm-hmm. she's not. As much as she still has an, an, an intellect and a mind, I don't think she's thinking as logically or sure. as clearly. So she probably would do what she did to the, the woman walking the dog, yeah. which is drop out of a tree. Good point. You know, fucking attack her and then just get out of there. And if yeah. all of a sudden, you know, it, it's very different when a few people go missing from a town. You can write off the first couple mm. and then maybe the police will start putting together a pattern if there starts being like three or four or five. Yeah. Um. I think there's that. And then I think there's the risk of creating more vampires. Sure. Okay. And I think it cuts way, way down on that risk. That is a good way to nip that in the bud if yeah. you don't want that to be a side a side effect. Yeah. yeah. And it also makes him um, culpable. Mm-hmm. It, it keeps him bound to her. Right. Um, right. Because she does need him to kind of get around during the day and, and, and to get them a place to live yeah. and probably make them money. And if he were to walk out. She could go into little girl mode and be like, yep. "My dad killed all those people." Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, Which is another thing where where I think that you know I think that's a very intentional choice probably on her part. Mm. Getting him to kill for her is it's sort of like a safety measure. Yeah. Oh, she's incredibly manipulative. But oh we'll, God. Yeah. We'll get into that in a bit. <laughs> but yeah, she's got uh, Richard Jenkins who plays her. Uh, they. She's. He, I believe in the uh, in either the Amazon. You know how when you pause it, it tells you the actors and stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was listed as dad, I think, or the dad. But obviously, that's not what he ends up being. Um, <laughs> but he's her de facto father yes. who is going out and uh, killing people to bring blood back. Yes. And what I really like about this is we never see him do it well. Yeah. He's yeah. like, because that's one of the things that I actually really liked about this is that... Um differently i think a little bit differently than the movie the uh the swedish movie in the in the book mm-hmm. it seems like there is more of a thread of richard jenkins's character is 
is coming to the end of his usefulness. Yes. So she now has to find someone to take his place. Yes. And once you find out that Richard Jenkins started this whole process mm-hmm. when he was Owen's age, yeah, that makes the whole thing a lot more... Um, uh, you look back at the the movie that you've watched thus far and it casts her behavior towards Owen in a very different light. Right, right. And uh, that whole setup with him, I think, is really is really fun because it allows it, they have these um, really not, not that I know from experience, but killing <laughs> killing a human is hard. Or it really? can be. Tell it can me be. more, Clay. Shut up, Amanda. <laughs> um, but they make it look very difficult. Yes. Uh, and it's not just you know Steven Seagal walking up and tapping somebody in the neck and they fall over and they yeah. die. <laughs> they, it's uh, it's. You know, he's got to chloroform them, Mm -hmm. then he's got to drag them into the woods, and then he's got to, like, throw them up in a tree, hang them from a tree like a deer. Yeah. And, you know, bleed them out. Right. And then he drops the thing. Right, because he's in the woods, in the snow, in the dark. Yeah. You know, he doesn't have, like, you know, work lights set up so that he can see what he's doing. Yeah. He's, he, and he's, it's pretty remote where he's at when he, when he kills that guy. And he doesn't, I don't think this movie gets enough credit for actually acts semi accidentally creating a pretty good looking vil- like killer masked killer yeah I have, the, uh, I have notes about that too with the trash bag mask good it's look like, that yeah. is actually really disturbing that was apparently richard jenkins's idea that's really great it yeah. was it was it's because it's so simple but it is very like almost a zodiac killer ish yeah. with that kind of squared off yeah. edges of, of the mask over the head my only the only thing i would say is if you're trying to sneak up on someone being covered in plastic is probably not the best yeah, way to go yeah you're probably a little walking, rustly walking through the snow in the yeah. woods covered in plastic <laughs> you're, you're going to make some noise yeah he would be killed by the quiet place monsters very quick oh my god yeah um, um well so i i yeah, we're kind of getting i guess we're going to get straight into the the owen abby relationship like what what exactly is she doing and all of that um but i also want to ask before we get fully into that Mm -hmm. about the 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 dad quote-unquote dad caretaker thomas whatever we're calling him Mm -hmm. um i found his choice of uh victims very interesting Mm. the demographic he's targeting he's going for other than other like a, a fellow adult man between you know probably ages like 50 and under mm. that's like gonna be the hardest demographic yeah, to he's kill not making it easy for yeah himself. he's not yeah. finding like little old men who are like sitting on a bench feeding pigeons who right. he can just be like bloop and you're dead yeah it's not uh what's the the terminology that they use in serial killer books like uh low v- low value targets or something you know they they, yeah. they always they always target the people who are you know, like whether it's sex workers yep. or people who are yep. uh, vulnerable populations, yeah, things yeah. like that. And it, it, it's a very, you know, you can go all the way to like nature documentaries where like sure. you see lions hunting and they pick out the antelope sex that is, is sex worker. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I found that that interesting because I think that plays too into he has a line early on when he's talking to Abby and, and she's upset with him for fucking it up Mm. and he says i know i'm getting sloppy i think i want to get caught Mm, yeah um and i think that might be this might be a bigger symptom of that where he's targeting you know he's clearly an older man he's targeting these young healthy like just out of high school so we're talking like 18 to 22 year olds like and and most of the ones he goes he seems to go after look pretty athletic or at least very healthy like it's like you are you are he really is setting himself up for failure at some point and he even uh in my favorite scene in the movie which is the botched Mm. killing Mm. um which is just as far as like ratcheting up tension in a scene goes it's great because i knew you were gonna like that one yeah he gets in the back in the back of the station wagon (laughs) yeah and it's such a great follow-up from the first one because the first kill the first kill that he does You've got this great shot of him, you know, the guy's driving the car and then mm-hmm. he's laying down in the back seat. You don't know he's there until he sits up. Yeah. And the guy driving still doesn't even see him. And yeah. you know, that whole that whole thing was really well done. And they used that to set up his modus operandi for the next one, mm-hmm. which ends up getting screwed up. Because yeah. he's got he's in the car with one person, then a second young strapping man <laughs> yes. gets into the car <laughs> and they start driving away so he has to be very quiet and uh mm-hmm. yeah the, and the guy's like throwing his bag on him yeah, and trying to adjust yeah. the seat back against him yeah and it's then... like in back to the future too when marty jumps into the back of biff's car <laughs> except marty is gonna murder biff yeah 
Um, I the thing that I found interesting is like, yeah, it's when they put they pull into the gas station. One guy gets out and goes mm-hmm. to get a you know a Slurpee or something, and he uh, Richard Jenkins continues to go through with it. Like he yeah. could if he if he really wanted to, he could have uh chloroformed that dude and just got mm-hmm. out of there. Yeah. But he decides to grab him, chloroform him, and then steal the car. Right. Which then, you know, causes the whole thing to come on un- un- undone and everything. But yeah. uh, I think yeah, I think there's some and I guess the other question is he brings he brings this acid with him, mm-hmm. which I guess is for the purpose he used it. I think so. Yeah, I, th- I think it's sort of his version of a cyanide too. Sure. Do, so, do we think that he brings that with him every time? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I think it's it's like a, yeah, it's like a fail safe. It, yeah. It's, it's like That's if, a hell if of I'm a fail safe. Get, yeah, if I'm gonna get caught, or I'm guessing even if there's a chance he's left behind some sort of evidence he needs to destroy, you know, burning it with acid is a pretty pretty good way of making something unrecognizable. Yeah. So once the car flips over, uh, he's gonna get caught. So he dumps the acid. Yeah. All over his that face. was. That's fucking intense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also, so I, th- I think part of the reason he goes through with it is because there has definitely been, you know, talking about ratcheting up tension. Mm-hmm. I think the stakes have, have rate have been risen. Mm, sure. Um, where after his first botched attempt at bringing her blood, because I, I could be wrong, but I'm guessing like being able to kind of, drain someone of blood into these big gallon jugs Mm. probably gives you more blood than just what abby can get herself sure by just biting somebody and and drinking it she probably has to leave a lot left over yeah um bring tupperware whether you take some home right right but if you if you've got your tupperware then what do you do yeah um so i'm guessing that it's sort of like they usually have some in reserve Mm. And because he fucked up, they don't anymore. Yeah. Which means that rather than being able to get by without have her having to go out and kill someone every night, maybe she has a few days in between each, mm. which makes them less suspicious. Yeah. Which makes them less likely to have to move. And also, she's very, uh, when he screws it up. Oh, yeah. She's very uh, a, a verbally abusive, at yeah, least. I don't know it, if she's it, it was, beating on him or anything, but... It, I, I really liked that scene because you can... you I think you first hear it from Owen's point of view through the wall. Yes. And the yeah. voice that's yelling sounds like a man's voice. Yeah. And so... Well, and later on, he says to her... Uh, Owen says to Abby, it's like, I heard your dad yelling at you or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And then the reveal that it's her yelling at him is, is pretty great that she's got this, like, terrifying, yeah. you know... And he's like cowering in the yeah. He's like crouched on the floor, like kind of looking very scared. Yeah, because I think that's uh, another thing too is that he's. It's kind of like you know he's he's locked in at this point. It's like you, you mm-hmm. are whether or not he still cares for this monster that he lives with. He's, Which I think he does. I think he does too. Yeah, but it's you know like any maybe not any abusive relationship, but. <laughs> It's it's an abusive you relationship. Know how when your abusive partner makes you kill people and bring the blood back for them, it happens all the time. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. Um, but you know, it is it is that idea sort of abusive relationship where he does love her, yeah. but she is getting very intense with him. Yes. And is very scary. And I think that probably is is a big part of it too about why he goes through with the second one is because yeah. he probably thinks if he fails again. That might be it. Right. Then you know? maybe maybe she will kill him. Or, I mean, maybe that's not, maybe maybe her leaving him would be enough. You yeah. Know? Maybe it's that kind of thing. Yeah. So there, there's a brief scene when he's getting ready to go out on that second kind of ill-fated attempt um, where they're in the kitchen and he's packing his bag mm-hmm. and she comes up and she touches him and she, she puts her hand on him and he kind of like pauses for a moment and like holds it there and kind of basks in it where I think you can really tell that he and and, and I found it really interesting because they the way they play it in this movie it did not come off as creepy to me yeah. where he like just kind of needs that moment with her and that that small sign of affection from her mm. and when he gets it he sort of shoots his shot and like takes his chance and says I don't want you to see that boy anymore right and she gets you know she pulls her hand back and kind of kind of leaves him there yeah um which i think is a good tie into the moment when um owen finds the photo booth photos right. of her and a young boy who i i think the implication is that it is mm. 
uh, Thomas. Yeah. That that's that's you know they met you know, when they were young. I don't she, think that they he was young. I don't think that they do this, but I'm surprised they don't have that mark on the kid's face. That would be a because he's yeah. Got, Richard Jenkins has that like birthmark or something that they have on his face under under, oh, under yeah, his eye. Or maybe yeah. it, it might be. Maybe it's not a birthmark. Maybe it's an. Uh, um, I'm misreading it. Maybe it was a scar or something. But yeah. I, it was one of those things where it's like, that feels like an identifier. It would have been an easy way to connect the two. You throw that on the kid. And then yeah. it's like, oh, obviously. Uh, but yeah, that line where he says, I don't want you to see that boy anymore. At that yeah. point at that point in the movie, I think it actually plays really well both ways. Mm-hmm. Because it plays both as a sort of... Um, Protective father. Exactly. Um and then also later on, it plays, once you realize what's going on, it plays more of like a someone who's a little bit jealous. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And probably knows that his, uh, his services are no longer needed to an extent. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, there is that really interesting question in this where um, <clears throat> it has Abby been knowing that Thomas is getting older and is kind of losing the will, I think, more, more importantly, he's mm-hmm. losing the will to continue to do this. Um, and I'm sure, you know, she's survived at this point for, well, like 200 years. I'm sure she can tell. Oh, yeah. I'm um, sure. Yeah. So when she, with knowing that she knows that, I think it's plausible that on meeting Owen, this very sort of isolated, lonely, disaffected boy, she kind of gets gets the idea, I think, pretty, pretty early on. Like, all right, let, let me let me feel this one out. Mm. Let me let me see what kind of person he is. And I think that's her, where she keeps encouraging him to hit the bullies back. Sure. Hit them back harder than you even dare. Yeah. It is sort of like, all right, and then, you know, we'll see if he does. And if he doesn't do it, then I maybe mean, he's not the right one. He's he's definitely a uh, serial killer in the making. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So may, maybe it'll be useful to go back a little bit. Yeah. Um. So there's there's this movie begins with that the great scene of the police officers and the, and the ambulance rushing a, a, a an injured man into the hospital, mm. and then we have that whole sequence, and then pretty soon after that we are introduced to Owen, um, a weird little creep, uh, with a clear plastic mask on his face, which another great <laughs> '80s thing. That works great for this because those things are the creepiest shit I've ever they seen. They are. They are very. And creepy. I feel like they only existed in the eighties and then they disappeared. Yeah, they're, I've never seen they're them nowhere to be found. Uh, yeah, a creepy little weirdo in a creepy mask with a knife in his bedroom who keeps saying, "Are you scared, little girl?" Mm-hmm. and stabbing at things and then spying on his neighbors through his telescope. Um, man, I guess the only- second half of that though is like that's not really that weird. Like, you know, you're a kid, you're lonely, you're in an apartment complex. I mean, I... You're probably going to peek in some windows. Sure, because you Nobody thought Jimmy Stewart was going to get out of that wheelchair and kill a bunch of people, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just think it's weird to give your kid a telescope. Yeah. Like, when you live that close to other people. Um, But, yeah, I mean, I, I, I found it hard to summon... A lot of sympathy for Owen mm. for quite a while in this movie. I, 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 even after even after you you start seeing the stuff with the bullies and everything, I started to feel for him somewhat at mm-hmm. that point. The the I think the moment where I really where I really started feeling like deeply sad for this kid was um, after he realizes that Abby is not a, a normal human. Mm. And he tries to wake up his mom and oh, yeah. she doesn't wake up. And then he tries to call his dad and his dad is like, oh, what, are you, what are you talking about? Is this, is this that crap your mother put in your head? You know, yeah. you tell her to call me when she's back and like, you, I don't want to hear anything about this anymore. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, wow. Yeah, you are. Yeah. He's really, really alone in the world. He's kind of the definition of what falling through the cracks at that time looked like. At yeah. least, at least generally how you see it in movies and stuff. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there's, you know, many different variations of that in real life. But mm-hmm. yeah, he's just, he's, uh, his parents are divorcing. His mother is drinking herself to sleep every night. Yeah. We don't even see her face very much. We see her face From like, like a for distance. a second. Yeah. 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 But she's not like a presence. She's, right. she's just, she's like, she's there as much as like the teacher in the, pe- in the peanuts is there, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. She, she is less present than the adults in like. A Nightmare on Elm yes, Street. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Which is all I kept thinking is that like this kind of reminds me of that where it's these kids or 
just one kid really because it's just owen mm. who is sort of having to navigate this really terrifying situation by himself and all of the adults in his life are no help right right um and he's got he's being bullied relentlessly at school to mm-hmm. the point where he's looking for some sort of uh if not retro well i mean i guess retribution but that's not really he doesn't even really think about retribution until she puts the the, the, the thought in his head yeah it's coming out in different ways where he's you know acting like a fucking weirdo <laughs> Travis Bickle guy they want to be in his, in his bedroom and then he goes and he buys a knife and yeah. he just has the knife and you there's yeah. like him just like jamming it into yeah. a tree just really fucking hard up yeah. that tree you know so and like there's and Abby just appears and goes what are you doing yeah they don't go so far as to like have him kill an animal or something but yeah. that's like but the next ca- step yeah I was gonna say and I think that's maybe what made it hard for me to feel a level of sympathy for him initially is that like Yes, you were going through these horrible things, but he also kind of refuses to tell his mom and, and, and the adults in his life what is happening with the bullies. Mm-hmm. Um, and, Do you and think the, it really would have made a difference, though? Because she's, she's so, I mean... Uh, maybe not the mom, but maybe yeah. a teacher. That's true. Yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't tell it to the gym teacher or anything. Right. Yeah. He just sort of is like, he kind of <clears throat> refuses to reach out, which I, I can I can understand, but... For me, it was really just thrown off by the, like, are you scared, little girl? Which is oh, yeah. his favorite yeah, line <laughs> to repeat. Yeah, so, it, which goes to your point that he's not really planning retribution. Mm. That little synopsis blurb that I read at the top of this um, isn't really accurate. Because it sounds more like what he's looking for is just violence. Mm. It's just sort of a way to maybe perpetrate some some hurt on someone else well and it's also that that um thing that he says are you scared little girl be- becomes a you as you watch the movie you realize it kind of yeah. becomes a uh indicator of the cycle of violence yeah because what he's saying to this fictional victim quote-unquote victim of his mm-hmm. is what the bully is saying to him calling him a little girl mm. and then then you find out that's what the bully's brother says to the bully right 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 that's so true you see this like stacked bullying uh thing going on yeah and uh he's just he's just not dealing with it well he, he yeah. needs he <laughs> needs a younger boy to push around what he need no right yeah that. oh my god um yeah well and, and i think that the difference between him and abby is that abby hurts people because she has to mm, like sure that's how she survives she she doesn't really have a choice she mm. can try to stop and it doesn't seem like she has much control over it after a point. Like like when Owen cuts his hand and she smells the blood, right. she can't help it. Right. She she likes him. She's she doesn't want to hurt him. It seems like, but she still can't control herself after mm-hmm. a point. Whereas, Owen seems like he's just waiting. He's just waiting for somebody to come along, that's more yeah. vulnerable than he is. Yeah, he's he's a really interesting character because like I don't think he's a- he's not actively looking for you know it's it's yeah. It's, he's kind of not active at all. Like he's yeah. not actively looking for anything. He's not he's, really actively doing anything until he needs to help Abby, right. and then he manages to distract the detective long enough for him to get. Yeah, which is a great murdered. scene too, where <laughs> you you visually have him make the choice. Yeah, where the uh, uh, Casey Jones is getting his blood drank to death, and he yep. reaches his hand out. And Owen reaches his hand out, but yeah. his, Owen's hand goes to the door of the and bathroom shuts and shuts the door. Out. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I like that a lot. Same. Um, but yeah, o- Owen is. Do you think, like, if, if we want to get into the uh, the relationship between the two of them and, and what mm-hmm. her intentions are, mm-hmm. um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about this that works really well is it is I I think it is very ambiguous whether. Abby is actively looking for Owen to take the place of Richard Jenkins Mm -hmm. or if that is just the outcome that will happen in this relationship they have now started. Right. You know what I mean? Like I, I, as you were saying, I think, I think she could have, uh, uh, played it a lot more villainous, Mm -hmm. which would have been way less interesting. Exactly. And her intentions could have been a lot more, um, clear, yeah. One way or the other. Yeah. But they play it um, pretty down the middle. Mm-hmm. And when you get to the end where Richard Jenkins is gone, she needs someone to take care of her. And now Owen has assumed that position. Yeah. You really don't know whether or not 
this has been her plan the whole time. I right. I don't know that it, it that it was. I I don't know that it was either. She's clearly very manipulative. Yeah, I th- I think she's maybe one of those people who I- is manipulative almost on instinct. Like mm. I I don't know if you've ever encountered a person like this in real life, but they're they're both compelling and charming and absolutely terrifying when you realize it. Sure. That they are somebody who they kind of just instinctually know the right thing to say mm-hmm. to get you interested in whatever they're doing or to get your sympathy or to get your attention like wh- whatever yeah. it is they're looking for subconsciously there's just like they they just kind of have an innate ability to sort of charm like those people on twitter or facebook where all they oh post God. is like where they say today was just i don't even know and then people <laughs> that's all they say oh my God, is, yeah so happened? then people go oh my i'm here for you whatever you need and it's like yeah. what is it's they're literally just it's a they're yeah. throwing a fishing line out hoping for exactly what you do you yeah. know what they are emotional vampires <laughs> they are emotional vampires uh similar to energy vampires yes but slightly different yes um but yeah they're, well they're, they're that's a very like that's a good example but that's a very like crude version of what i'm talking about sure like well, that's the, what i'm here for yeah yeah. <laughs> the, yeah the crudeness yeah um but yeah there, there are just people in the world who are really really good at saying the thing you want to hear mm. and they don't even really realize they're doing it right and i think she's maybe one of those where yeah. there is some level of you know maybe maybe deep down she kind of realizes that she's uh she's she's just kind of keeping an eye out just in case another good alternative to uh her current caretaker presents itself Mm -hmm. but i do but i do think that she has genuine feeling towards owen i think she feels a connection i think she she wants a friend i think she's lonely um i think she relates more to him than she can to thomas anymore yep um and maybe you know she kind of misses having that that peer relationship that she used to have and I think maybe she's looking for something like that. Yeah, and I, I wonder if, if that is um, a result of the fact that they 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 kind of go a little bit different than they usually do in these movies where you've mm-hmm. got a young vampire who it's always like um, they look like they're 12 but they're 300 years old right. and, they, and they have all of this like, they act yes. like an older person. Yeah, they start like quoting socrates to you yeah. and like in like in in latin yeah and all yeah. that stuff i was yeah. gonna i was gonna ask you uh how you thought this compared uh the way that they play her here compared to uh mm. homer from mm, near dark that's a good question yeah that's a really interesting comparison actually because even sort of in vibe like in in the atmosphere of this movie i got some near dark vibes yeah definitely. yeah of this sort of like wasteland ish area and and vampires kind of moving between and among us Mm -hmm. uh, like undetected um yeah so between her and homer i mean definitely homer is played more in that that mode we were just talking about where it's he's he's in a 13 year old boy's body but he's got the mind of a you know brilliant adult man right um which I think always introduced these weird contradictions. Whereas I wonder if Abby's character isn't a little more believable. Yeah. Because just because you're alive for a long time doesn't mean you automatically become like a mature adult when you've never had any of those sorts of experiences that would make right. you a mature adult. Right. Um, like there's nothing there's nothing mature about the way that she approaches the the relationship with Owen. Like it's not No. She's like ignorant of she's like, Well, what does it mean to go study? If I'm yeah. your girlfriend, do we do anything different? Yeah. Like like she's very much kind of been she's she's like trapped in amber in a way. Like right. like she's never really progressed beyond this very because like you you know She you, doesn't she doesn't have that thing where he's like, Do you want to be my girlfriend? And she gives this speech about how yeah. like uh you know, you don't want anything to do with him. I've been around long enough. Like she, yeah, that's when they could yeah. bring that out where she, she, she says a twelve-year-old version of that, which is we can't be friends. Yeah, and then even does that? Do I have to do anything? Right. It's yeah. Like, yeah. No. It's like, no. So it's so we just it's do just the like same. this. It's like yeah. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I I like that she's played 
in this way where she she clearly has experienced more and seen more but it's not on a human level like it's, mm. it's not a normal like it, it's, she hasn't had the sort of experiences that would make you more mature and more adult she's had experiences that are gonna like traumatize the fuck out of you right. um there's actually an, a deleted scene mm. um that you can watch on youtube of uh it's i think it's from the the scene where it's what it's one of the first times that owen sees her be a vampire yeah I, I, she's got blood all over her face yeah and she like touches him on the side of the face. Yeah. And he gets this mental image of her being turned into a vampire. Oh. And it's actually really disturbing. Like it's not graphic. Yeah. But uh, I'll show it to you when we're done if you want to see it. Yeah, I do. Um, but it's 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 really tense and weird. And it's like yeah. it's it's very um, impressionistic about what's going on. But it's it's really it's really intense. Yeah, that's interesting because so I think we've done a good job thus far of kind of skirting away from talking about the book, <laughs> um, but I'm going to talk about it now. Please do. Um, mostly because I think what we're talking about, it's interesting to think about the way the book handles it and the way this movie handles it, mm -hmm. where in the book you find out that Abby, who I forget what her character's name is in the original book, it's it's different, um, but you you find out and and it's kind of hinted at in this where she says would you still like me if i wasn't a girl right and owen says like yeah but like why are you saying that and she's like well what if i'm not a girl mm. it's like well, well then what are you well i'm nothing well you can't be nothing so in the book which here yes. makes reads as though She's a monster. Of yeah, some I'm sort. not human yeah. at all, yes. so I can't be a boy or yeah. a girl. Yeah, which is the kind of which is the kind of response one might give if they've been a vampire for 200 years. Yeah, and they don't have that sense of human identity anymore. Exactly, yeah. and it kind of it, you know, and you were young enough when you were turned that you didn't exactly like what 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 did it you know if you're prepubescent what does it feel like to be a girl or right. a boy? You're just a kid, right? Like it, you're kind of you know, it's 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 not until you hit puberty and have these sort of physical signifiers and society starts treating you differently right. that you really start to form that kind of identity around your gender. Um, and I don't think she had a chance to do that. And then in the book, you find out that Abby was, was a boy mm -hmm. um, and was castrated and turned into a vampire. Right. So there is this weird, like, I think it's, I think it's interesting to watch this movie knowing that, whether or not you would still consider Abby a girl, she doesn't consider herself a girl. Right. I think it's interesting watching this based on that and like that masculine voice that she has when she is a vampire. Like, I think it's actually like really fascinating that she sort of lives this existence that has separated her from humanity in so many ways, including her own ability to like, define what what gender she would even want to yeah. be like yeah. she just she doesn't know she can't know right it, it's just it, it's just completely it's a part of the human experience that is lost to her mm. where she doesn't get to make a choice whether that choice is male female or you know non-binary or whatever yeah she just doesn't get to have it yeah that that stuff um in the book i mean they do they do touch on that in the movie the uh, swedish movie as well mm, really uh they don't go super into it but you do get a from what I remember, a fairly graphic shot of her uh, uh, or his um, mute, uh, mutilated genital area, which Oof. is fun. Um, but yeah, it's not necessary. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I was wondering, like, you know, th the big changes that you have, at least from what I understand, is that is that where it's mm -hmm. clear that Abby or I think in the original one, her name is or his name is Eli. Yeah. Or it's, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Ellie, Ellie or Eli. Yeah. I don't know how it would be pronounced if you were Swedish. Yeah. You, you find <laughs> out that that character looks like a girl, but yes. was actually a boy. And then yeah. also the caretaker is yeah, like that was what straight I was up a pedophile. Yes. Yes. So in the book, he was a teacher that was fired when uh, it was discovered that he had child pornography in his possession. Ah. And his motivation for being with I'm just going to keep calling her Abby sure um is that he is quote unquote in love with her mm -hmm. meaning sexually attracted to her sure and they met when he was an adult sure so this isn't some like 
oh, we both met as children and then she's a vampire, so she stays the same, but I am a human, so I grow old and I look different, but I fell in love with her when I was 12. Right. And that's where my feelings come from, which is kind of what this American version paints Thomas into. Whereas that character in the book was, yeah, straight up a pedophile and, and would was very much like, yeah, I'll go kill people for you. Mm. Will you let me touch you? Ugh. Yeah, it's 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 not books. Books are so gross. Yeah, why Which, do we why do we read them? It's uh, I always find it so Guys, fascinating. Why have the I stuff, read so many books? No, it's it's so strange. <laughs> it, it's always so fascinating to me when you see a movie that is yeah. fairly disturbing and dark yeah, in its own there's right. Like, there's a bunch of people getting really, really straight up gr- gruesomely murdered. Yeah. There's a guy who's dumping acid on his own yeah, face. Yeah, there's some like, shit going on. And a little girl ripping the throats out of people. Right. Like, yeah. And then you, then you, and American Psycho falls under this as well. Oh, yeah, where yeah, There's yeah. some pretty yeah, brutal stuff really happening in American point. Psycho. <laughs> then you go back to the book and it's like, like it's so much more fuck? brutal like, how than you possibly Like, how did you make imagined. this worse? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I do wonder... That is an interesting parallel. I hadn't really connected American Psycho <laughs> like that. Yeah, you're right. They're the same movie. Yeah. yeah, I mean, essentially. it's. I just find it interesting because to me, and I, maybe it's unfair for me to say this having not read the book, and I, so I don't have mm. a full understanding of everything, mm-hmm. but I find this so much more interesting as far as how those relationships go. mm but I guess it's I guess it depends on what your intention is as to uh, how you want the relationships to connect to it. You know, because it's like I find this idea that Abby is this child vampire who essentially uh, is intentionally or possibly or unintentionally moving uh, uh, having children her own quote unquote age fall in love with her who then become this sort of protector figure until they she's got a good like 40 to 50 years out of them and then she's got to get a new one yeah until (laughs) and and you know there's this bond that's this unbreaking bond and then eventually that guy's got to go and she's got to find another one yeah i find the ambiguity of those relationships and the way that those two relationships work together to be more narratively satisfying to me than Oh, this guy was a pedophile who, yeah. you know, was killing people because he wanted to touch her or, you know. Yeah, it, yeah no, I, I, I totally agree. And I actually that's that's definitely in my notes how I found the way that that character was handled much more compelling. Yeah. In this, which I was surprised because you know, I'm usually one of those people who is like, well, the book is always better. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in this case, I actually I really like that choice because I think, like you said, it, it's it's more interesting. Um and it, it adds a layer of complexity to all the characters yeah. involved in the relationship. Um, it adds a layer of complexity to Owen's choice to stand by her because he's clearly a pretty perceptive kid. He, mm. he seems pretty disturbed when he looks at those photos of her with another little boy. Right. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if, if he at least somewhat put together that like she's done this before, whether or not he's realizing it was that guy that he thought was her father he he's clearly it's evidence that she's befriended young a young boy of her quote unquote age in the past um and it puts him in in a position where he knows he's not the first right it's not this like unique she's never made a friend like this before like no it's definitely happened he has the evidence and he still chooses to stand by her and eventually run away from home in his life with her um, and I think it adds a, a layer of, you know, to him as a character that he does that. Yeah. I, I wonder if, if the original book take on it is is supposed to be a little bit, it's supposed to be bittersweet in a different way the way it ends where mm. essentially they're going off. I assume that, is that how it ends in the book? They go off together? I don't really remember. I'm gonna th- I, I think I, I think the movie did. ends that way. So I'm going to say that that's Let's how it Let's just stick with it. Yeah. Um, and so the two of them finding each other and going off with each other with this more darker take on Abby's backstory yeah. maybe has a little bit more bittersweetness to it where she's finally found someone yeah. to be with that makes her happy, but you're also thinking, eh, it's probably not going to go too well. Whereas this one I find I find there is... I find that I just find this more narratively satisfying because yeah. it all kind of works together really well with what they've put together and the way, you know, her existence flows and how he's yeah. been sucked into it. And 
yeah. you get that bittersweet ending where you know he's found a friend she's mm-hmm. found a friend but you know she's found <laughs> there's some questionable she's found a puppet, details yeah 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 i would actually argue that like if, if we're just going to continue assuming that in the book they they also run away together mm-hmm. um which i'm happy to do <laughs> um i think that's more of a generic just like quote unquote happy ending mm. Um, where it is like she's lived this life kind of of torment mm. and she's finally found somebody who cares about her for who she is and not for what they can get out of her. Yeah. Um, and they get, and he's been neglected, ign- ignored and bullied and, and et cetera. And they get to go be together and make a life together. I actually find that more just kind of blanket like, Oh, isn't that nice? Yeah. <laughs> the vampire girl now has like a boyfriend. Um, and I found, I find this version more bittersweet and complicated right which i think is why it's more narratively satisfying because it allows you to imagine several different futures for them Mm -hmm. where you know 45 years from now he might be thinking oh my god i i am like she talks to me this way she treats me this way she can't even look at me she doesn't want to be around me i'm that guy now right right um which i think is a lot more i'm sure uh, Richard Jenkins was in the same position. Yeah, I love you know. how you keep calling him Richard Jenkins. It's just easier because I talk, whatever. It's it's an easy signifier. Anybody listening I'm, I'm to terrible this, with I'm, I apologize on anyway, behalf of point my being, colleague. You've heard it here first. Amanda says books are dumb. <laughs> um, here, look. I'm in. I'll write my thesis on why books are dumb. <laughs> um, body count. I didn't count, but uh, the. There's a lot in this one. Quite a few. Yeah. yeah. I wasn't thrilled with the CGI vampire no, stuff. No, I actually, like, yeah, that's another one of my notes where it's like, I love the concept that yeah. she sort of becomes this, like, wiry, spry, like, guy, like kind of with that almost inhuman movement. Yeah. Like, I love the idea, but I wish... I wish the uh, technology had caught up to what I'm sure they were envisioning in yeah. 2010. Yeah, I... I, I it seemed like both elements, her and her, the person she was attacking, were both CGI because they both yeah. had that sort of weird rubbery <laughs> thing going on. Yeah. Which could have worked for just her. Yeah. Considering she's not human. I think, but... I bet it looks better on a big screen because oh, yeah. those, because it looks almost good. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's close. Yeah, the, bo- the two times that they do it, they kind of do it either with like a lot of backlighting so it's in silhouette right. or it's a little right. obscured. But <laughs> like, on a smaller when... screen... When that stuff is condensed, it's a little easier to see that the wobbliness of it. Yeah, I like when she scrambles up the tries to scramble up the tree though, and her foot keeps slipping. Yes, <laughs> like, yeah. I actually really liked that detail. Yeah. I thought that was like a well chosen little detail to kind of sprinkle in there. Yeah, I love that stuff. I yeah. love it when characters are bad at their jobs. Yeah, it's so boring to see someone who's good at their job. Yeah, if they're just a perfect killing machine all the time, then you're a boring killing machine. Exactly. Yeah. That's why most of the best characters are terrible at their jobs. <laughs> James Bond, terrible secret <laughs> yeah, agent. Yeah. He's yeah. actually very, very conspicuous, isn't yes. he? <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I almost wish that, I don't know, I assume both of those things were CGI, like both elements. Mm. I almost wish that they had the victim just make a bunch of herky-jerky movements and then yeah. they tried to, I, I bet they could do it better now. Let's I, I think they could, yeah. Um, so how did, how did you feel about the gore in this movie mm-hmm. when it's used and then when it's not? I thought it was great. Yeah. I thought the the balance was really good. I thought so too. Um, That's why I wanted to kind of bring it up on both ends. Yeah. I don't think they overdid it. No. Um, But like specifically, I really liked that, you know, you you sort of get the same scene twice in this movie. You you get at the very beginning where they bring Thomas into the hospital Mm -hmm. and then you get kind of halfway through the movie when we've kind of caught back up to that moment and Abby goes to see him in the hospital and in the beginning, you don't see his face. Right. And I love that. Yeah. Like, I love that they don't try to start off with some sort of shocking, like, oh, my God, look how much, look how many hours he spent in makeup this morning. Right. Yeah. Um, and But I, I don't know. I kind of went back and forth on whether I liked it or not that they showed his face at all. Mm. But I think in the end, it works because he has that moment with her that sort of like saying goodbye. Yeah. Um, you get to see he does all the acting with his eyes. Yeah, you know? which was actually pretty impressive. I thought, Richard Jenkins, good actor. God damn yeah. it, Casey Jones. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I uh, I thought that I I think one of the um, the big 
pluses to this movie is that it's just beautifully shot yeah and just well conceived front to back visually yeah so um they do a really good job of balancing when to show you the blood and when to kind of like you know pull off a little bit yeah um even that scene where she kills the the guy who's jogging is the CGI is kind of rubbery, yeah. but it's not really a bloody scene. Right, like that's more not as brutal. Like you said, yeah, that's not quite as brutal as the following scene where Richard Jenkins has to dispose of the body. Yeah, you know where you know you feel like the weight of how heavy it is, and, and he's kind of limping still. Yeah, from, from twisting his ankle earlier in the movie. Yeah, it it and so it's really it's it's uh it's really well done in that regard. I do have to say. Mm. From what I remember, the scene where the where the the woman who turns into a vampire catches yeah. fire is better in the other movie because okay. that one it was fi- it was good, but it was clearly all fake fire. Mm. The one in the original Swedish movie is like they just lit a bed on fire <laughs> and it's just like <laughs> towering inferno. It's it's awesome. Oh, it's so great. Sweets. Um, so how do you feel about the inclusion of that detail? Um, it is kind of weird, like narratively. Yeah. Uh, it makes more sense in the book because there's other stuff that happens in the book. Sure. With, so, spoiler alert. Mm-hmm. I'm um, not going to read it. So. I figured. <laughs> I mean, books are dumb. I've seen two movies based on, I'm not reading the book. <laughs> it's too much. I got the gist. Um, in the book, she ends up killing the Hakon, he's Hakon or Hakon, I can't pronounce it, but Thomas, the caretaker, the the quote unquote father. Oh, sure. The Swedish version of him in the book, Abby ends up killing him, Mm -hmm. um, but she doesn't finish the job. Oh, really? So he comes back as like this kind of mindless, insane thing that is a vampire, but is just purely driven by its obsession with her. Huh. So... I don't know if I like that either. Yeah. I guess it's tough. It's tough to make that decision outside of reading the book. But. Yeah. I mean, even in the book, it's it, it's kind of a questionable moment. Sure. His whole motivation is, I'm going to rape you now. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, the little stuff. Yeah. Uh, but but so I think in the book, it makes more sense because there are a couple of moments w- where she doesn't finish the job with mm. killing somebody and it comes back to, <gasps> no pun intended, bite her in the ass. Mm. Um, which is why when you were like, why is she making him kill people for her? I was like, maybe it's because they don't yeah. want vampires well, yeah, running that's around. That's a good point, yes. Because it happens in the book a couple times. She botches it. Right. And they come back. Um, so I think I think that that scene included in the book makes a lot more sense. And in the movie, it was sort of like, I mean, it was definitely like a cool moment where the, the reveal that she's gnawing on her own arm yeah. and then the nurse opens the curtains and she just immolates immediately that nurse had a hell of a week yeah because first she has to deal with that guy jumping <laughs> out the window the same nurse i assume so and then she gets burned the to death. only nurse in in new mexico yeah. she gets burned to death by ac- an accidental vampire explosion yeah, you know, yeah. It's rough rough week that sucks rough couple days that sucks that's that's interesting um i mean it's too the the image is too good to cut out i, I think guess. that was maybe yeah. their problem and like i'm i'm unfortunately one of those people who's a big proponent of the phrase kill your darlings sure um so i honestly think it shouldn't have been in there yeah i don't know I you just want to see it though yeah. yeah i would probably keep it <laughs> um music for this movie music. was done by uh michael giacchino which i did not know it mm. uh, the first time i saw it he is a uh, fantastic uh film composer he did the Music for the new Star Trek oh. movies, uh, which has is one of the best themes that I've heard in a long time. He's he's very good. Yeah. He's actually uh, also doing the music on the next Batman movie, oh, which cool. is being directed by Matt Reeves, director what? of Let, the right, Let, Let Me In. Yeah. So wow. um, yeah, Matt Reeves is a really interesting history. Yeah, I don't really know anything about him. So he. Uh, <laughs> He made one movie in like the early nineties. He's uh-huh. he's a little bit older than I thought he was. Mm. He made one movie in like the mid to er, uh, early to mid nineties that was terrible, <laughs> okay. and then he disappeared for a while. <laughs> he had to do some soul searching. Yeah, he did like a few. I guess he's friends with J.J. Abrams. Oh, he did okay. a few episodes of Felicity, and then uh, <laughs> what? He, yeah, then he made Cloverfield. 
Oh, it's that guy. Yeah. I love Cloverfield. Yeah, he did Cloverfield. Then he did uh, the two Planet of the Apes sequels oh, that man. are both really good. Yeah. And uh, he did this, and he's doing Batman now. My mind is kind of blown. Yeah, he's, I, he's a low-key, really good director. Yeah, I can't believe I've never, like, like that his name didn't jump out to me immediately, especially where, like, I really love Cloverfield. I think Cloverfield's yeah. a fantastic movie. I hope it's on the list, because I'd love to talk about that. Oh, God, that would be really fun. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I, uh, you know, especially, having not watched one of his movies in a while, I, mm-hmm. I, I liked the um, Planet of the Apes movies, and I liked Cloverfield. But yeah. after watching this, I am that much more excited about him doing Batman. Yeah, yeah, because he does do this sort of like the dark palette and, mm. and this sort of violence without going overboard yeah. and the like moral ambiguity. He handled it really well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. And the music, uh, they, they released a little camera test for yeah. uh, Batman mm. with uh, some of Giacchino's score behind it and it mm. sounds pretty good. I'm looking nice. forward to hearing the rest of it. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, the, the, the soundtrack in this and the sound effects. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's really interesting about the sound tra- soundtrack to me is, again, they didn't go like retro with it. It's a very classic sounding yeah. orchestral soundtrack. They didn't go, oh, it's in 1983, break out the synthesizers. Yeah, yeah. where's my guitar? Which, honestly, I would have loved that too. But, but it wouldn't have fit. Like, I think the thing that makes this so great is that, like, the time period matters in so much as. It gives you a couple touchstones of like, you know, kids were just kind of allowed to just exist without parental supervision and yeah. there were no cell phones. Yeah. But beyond that, the time frame doesn't really matter. No, not really. Yeah. Yeah. I almost kind of wish that they didn't tell you when it took place at the beginning. Yeah. It, it almost seems like an unnecessary detail. Yeah. Because like, like you were saying, I think you can get it. Yeah. If you're paying attention, you're like, oh, Ronald Reagan. Oh, this must be the 80s. Ronald yeah. Reagan, uh, you know. They're playing Miss Pac-Man. Right, right. Yeah. Um, So finally, uh, the placement on the list. Yes. I would like to call shenanigans with this list a little bit. (laughs) Because uh, Let Me In is at number 90, which on the first, on the one hand, is higher than The Shining, which probably don't think that should be the case. Yeah. However, Let the Right One In, the movie it's based on, let me let me uh, just to refresh your memories here. Um, let me in is number ninety with an eighty eight percent score, which is a ninety four percent about ninety five percent adjusted. Let the right one in is a ninety eight on Rotten Tomatoes with a ninety percent audience score, and it is huh. not on the list at all. And the number of reviews and and ratings is yeah. only like it's not that much of a difference so i'm not sure why this movie is not on the list all right clay i think it's time for us to call rotten tomatoes and be like and be put on hold what the fuck are yeah. you guys doing with this list yeah i mean that you know this is just negligence by who i don't know what joker <laughs> is in charge over there of the uh editorial best of lists yeah, at Rotten Tomatoes yeah. but someone's got to get fired for this I think well it's it's interesting because I think the the further we get into this list the more we question the criteria of how and why things get put on it sure yeah um <laughs> and also where they get placed yeah yeah it's gonna be interesting we're probably gonna lose track the more of these we do but I think so I I just I just like I love I actually really enjoy having the shining at kind such a weird a place because yeah, it's, it's such it, a good barometer and it's, yeah. and it's right sort of in the middle of the list where it's 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 100 and 101 101 yeah um so yeah it gives you an idea of like everything after that should be worse than the shining yeah but everything before that should be better at least in terms of a horror movie like e- yeah. even if you want to ignore the sort of you know stanley kubrick master strokes of the shining like yeah. is this objectively a scarier movie right i don't think so yeah like I, I think The Shining is more frightening. Yeah, and I, you know, I think there's maybe this is unfair because this gets into a little bit more wishy washy territory. But I, I feel like there's <laughs> got to be some some extra criteria or criterion. Is that the sing- singular? <laughs> no, cri- criteria. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. Whatever. I don't fucking care. Some extra <laughs> marker uh, that um, accounts for like influence or something or like yeah. status because the the movies that are like in the top 10 
I think we've talked, may have talked about this before. I definitely have yeah. talked about it with you. I don't know if we've said it on the show. <laughs> is a mix of like movies that from yeah. 1920 and <laughs> from like last year. Yeah, <laughs> so yes. Yeah. It's really, it's very strange. Well, and, and that and, makes me wonder is it just the, a matter of how many people are reviewing this currently? Yeah, maybe. You know, like, like, cause it seems like the really old ones that are sort of the classics that, mm-hmm. that lots of people will go back to. Um, have maintained their position sure. and then a lot of the new ones which are great uh, they're great movies but they're sort of squeezing out these ones from like the 70s and the 80s yeah. that that it's this list has a bit of uh imdb 250 best movies disease where it's mm. like the godfather and then like the dark knight are the yeah. top two and it's like <laughs> yeah it's calm like down maybe guys. not yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, we'll get into that more uh, as as we go on. At least we have like a running uh, a running plot line to yeah, get into. Yeah. So. Um, so I hit the uh, randomizer. Beep, boop, 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 boop. And next time will be uh, number 125. I'm Ooh. so excited to watch this. I haven't watched this movie in a long time. Peter Jackson's Dead Alive. Oh, okay. Which I'm kind of shocked is even on this list, frankly, because it's like... Yeah, I don't know this one. Oh, just... <laughs> Get prepare yourself. Ah, uh, one of these days we're gonna watch a movie that I know better than you. It's gonna happen. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> It'll happen when I get to do my wild card pick. Yes, that's I'm what looking it will for. It. Well, that's that's you know that's <laughs> what I'm here for. I'm I'm here to to to, to see stuff I haven't seen. Yeah. Uh, for you to see stuff you haven't seen. Uh, that's the whole the whole f- reason that I wanted to do this list is, is to do that. So, awesome. uh, thanks guys for listening. If yeah, you, thank you. Uh, would like to give us a rating or review on iTunes, that would be much appreciated. And uh, Amanda, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me, Clay. And we'll be back next time, kicking ass for the Lord with Dead Alive. <laughs> Bye, guys.